Hello and welcome to Memo Anime Recaps. Do not forget to like and subscribe. In the opening scene, the young heir to the Saiga fortune, Masaru Saiga, enjoys a circus show like any normal kid. Only this time, the circus show didn't go as planned. After only a few minutes of showcasing their skills, the stuntmen and women turn rogue and use their puppets to slaughter everyone in the audience. Masaru takes advantage of the distraction and runs as fast as his legs can carry him to the city. The following day, a particular stunt woman from another circus dresses up to prepare for her show which is to happen in the next few minutes. Meanwhile, the part-time mascot for the circus, Narumi Kato, directs fans and visitors into the auditorium where the show will be conducted. Little did he know that his life was going to change for the worse in a few minutes. Just then, a runaway boy carrying a large suitcase, Masaru, bumps into him and asks Narumi to take him in the direction of the circus. Narumi takes a look at the weird boy and realizes just how well-groomed he is. Masaru had the rich kid look so Narumi struggled to understand why he would appear so lost and clueless. Masaru, upon noticing that Narumi isn't ready to help, leaves to continue searching for someone who can help him. Narumi tried to call him back but then his Zonafa panic attack came and he started having seizures. To get himself back to normal, he has to make someone laugh. But then again, who would be crazy enough to laugh at his suffering? Narumi thought of several things to do, but then ended up embarrassing himself in front of the passers-by. Luckily for him, Masaru stopped by and laughed at his horrible display. In a few seconds, Narumi is saved from dying, and he returns to normal. Masaru turned back to continue his journey, but then he was caught and kidnapped by three weird-looking sentient beings who turned out to be the puppets from the puppeteering assassins. Narumi considered doing his thing and staying out of rich people's business. However, the good man in him couldn't bear to watch a child suffer. So, he gets up and rescues Masaru from getting abducted by the three puppets. The men got back up and kept on staring at Narumi. Narumi, who didn't know they were puppets, punched them and accidentally dislocated one of their shoulders. When he found out about their true identity, Narumi took Masaru and ran into a train heading somewhere else. On their way to their next destination, Masaru Masaru smiles and tells Narumi he looks much scarier than he looks. Narumi, in an attempt to scold Masaru for putting him in danger, gets another panic attack and forces Masaru to laugh at him. Luckily, Masaru did, and this cured his attack for now. After getting his head back to normal, Masaru introduces himself as the son of the CEO of the biggest IT and automobile company in all of Japan, Saiga Group. He also tells Narumi about his inheritance, and Narumi connects the dots as to why the assassin puppets were after him. He gets a little more curious and asks Masaru Masaru how his dad died. Masaru tells him his dad kicked the bucket in a road accident and during the investigations, they found a doll stuck in one of his tires and attributed it to causing the accident. Moving on, Masaru mentions one of the things his grandpa had told him several years back when he was much younger. That day, his granddad introduced him to his little puppeteering laboratory and showed him all the puppets the Saiga men in the Saiga family called the Karakuri puppets. He says studying the history and mechanics behind puppeteering is what makes them a successful company, and at the time, the Saiga property was valued to be in the billions. To end his speech, his granddad got up and told his grandson to take a particular large briefcase and run as fast as he could to a person named Shirogani in case his dad died before he grew up. On hearing all he had to say, Narumi asked him to tell him who Shirogane was. Masaru tells him he doesn't know her yet, but he does know that she's always going to be in the circus close to him. Narumi suddenly understands the reason why Masaru needed to get to the circus back then. He advises him to get to the cops next time and not the circus. Just then, another one of the puppet assassins shows up and Narumi punches him. This time, the puppet ignored all of Narumi's attacks and punched him as hard as he could just so he could get to Masaru and finish his mission. Narumi stands in front of Masaru to protect him from the terrifying puppet. At that instant, another one of the puppets steps onto the train track and stands in front of that train. The driver tried as hard as he could to brake so he wouldn't hit the puppet standing. Sadly, he couldn't make it in time, and the train got derailed. As the train rolled off the tracks, Masaru started crying again like the baby boy he was. Narumi slaps some sense into him and urges him to grow some balls if he wants to survive. Then, Narumi leaves Masaru on the train and pushes the puppet outside the window. Once the train comes to a stop, Masaru gets off the train and finds himself facing another puppet. Initially, he tries running away, but when he remembers what Narumi had told him, he picks up a rock and throws it at the puppet. Then, he shouts Shirogani's name when he finds out they just arrived at the circus, and Shirogani appears to be on top of a wire several feet above the ground, about to walk it. Upon seeing Masaru, the person she's sworn to protect, she gets off her wire and summons her puppet, Arlequin, to take care of the puppet assassin. After beating it down, she checks in on Masaru to make sure he's not hurt. Masaru asks for some backstory, 
and she tells him his grandpa had hired her mother back when they were in France. Narumi got up with his dislocated shoulder, and Masaru rushed to check up on him. Shirogani rushed towards Narumi to confront him as she thought he was also an enemy. Masaru tried to get her to stop, but she wouldn't listen. In the end, he jumps in between them and gets punched in the face till he's knocked out. Shirogane rushes in to protect her contact and tells Narumi to beat it. Narumi, who was already tired of the trouble, heads back outside and finds the rescue team trying to save the passengers on the train that derailed. Narumi gets pissed and decides to get back and help Masaru, so incidents like that don't repeat itself. In the meantime, the head of the assassin puppeteers phones his employers and reports the bad news to them. When asked to give an account of what happened, he tells them about Shirogane and her puppets. Elsewhere, Narumi finds Shirogane carrying the hurt Masaru in the streets through the heavy rain. He stopped her and spoke some sense into her head. In the end, they both agree to take Masaru to Narumi's special doctor. After getting five stitches in his hand, the doctor leaves Masaru to make a speedy recovery. Shirogane asks Narumi why he came back for them, and Narumi tells her it's because he won't be able to get a good night's sleep if he had left Masaru in the streets. With that, Shirogane brings herself to trust him for a little bit, but before she can say anything else, another bigger and much more dangerous puppet shows up. Almost immediately, Shirogane and Narumi get themselves ready for the fight of their lives to protect the heir to the Saiga Empire, Masaru. Shirogane and Narumi step outside in the rain to meet the man behind the puppet assassins and his special puppet. Pulsanella. Before fighting them, the assassin leader gloats about his special puppet, and dares both fighters to take down his special puppet. Around that time, Masaru wakes up from his slumber, and finds his two protectors facing the leader of the assassins in a deadly matchup. In the meantime, the assassin leader speaks softly to his unalive puppet, and promises to oil it up perfectly if it can carry out his commands and take down the two humans in front of him. As the battle is about to begin, Shirogani takes out her puppet, and stands against the terrible assassin boss in front of her. The assassin boss thanks Shirogani for finally giving him a chance to beat down a fellow puppet master. Shirogani ignores him and controls her puppet to fight against the assassin's puppet, Pulsanella. To the assassin boss's dismay, his puppet, Pulsanella ends up getting destroyed by Shirogani's Arlequin. Too bad for her though because he was able to buy his men some time to sneak into the hospital and capture Masaru. By the time Shirogani faces back, she finds Masaru held in bondage by three hefty men who threatened to slit his throat. With nothing else left to do, Shirogani waits for a miracle to somehow happen. As she's about to give up hope, Narumi, who'd already snuck in with the men, shows up out of nowhere and beats the shit out of them, saving Masaru in the process. The assassin boss sees how outnumbered he is, so he bails out while he has the chance so he can live to fight another day. After they're gone, the doctor enters the room and finds the entire place in shambles. He throws a fit and starts telling them just how much he's going to have to spend to fix things. Again, Masaru gets sad and cries. Narumi, who's just about had it with Masaru's babyishness, gets down on his knees and tells Masaru to stop crying and just laugh instead. Little did Masaru know, that Narumi was having another Zonafa attack. The doctor who was standing near them recognized the illness Narumi had and told the others about it. Shirogani, upon hearing this, rushes to disinfect Masaru's body parts as she thinks the sickness is contagious. Luckily for her, it isn't. But then again, Narumi needs to make someone laugh, or else he might die. He gets on a chair after listening to the doctor talk about his illness and tries to make the occupants of the room laugh. When Shirogani tells him she can't laugh due to her condition, Narumi runs outside to find someone who will laugh at his jokes and funny gestures. Masaru and Shirogane follow him through to a convenience store, where they find him scaring people with his weird and scary gestures. Shirogane steps up and stops him from making a kid cry. She then reprimands him in front of everyone for doing such a thing, and tells him to try and act more subtly next time. The weird and funny way Shirogane acted made people think she and Narumi were both comedians. As such, they appreciated their comedic efforts by laughing at their act. Masaru also joins the crowd and laughs with them. This makes the panic attack die down down for the meantime, as Narumi has finally made people laugh at him. After their ordeal at the convenience store, Narumi takes Shirogane and Masaru to his place. While Shirogane cooks some dinner, Narumi settles down and asks Masaru a few more questions about his family. Masaru used to be a bastard child, born by wedlock from his father's mistress. Up until about three years ago, he was never really accepted into the Saiga family. One day while he was younger, a lawyer came to inform him of his mother's death and also introduced him to his father, Saiga. With tears on his 
Narumi's face, Masaru tells Narumi that he was never interested in the inheritance for once. All he ever wanted was to earn enough money to buy a suitable coffin and bury his mother the right way. Narumi also gets teary-eyed and turns over to the other side after hearing all the horrible things that happened to Masaru. Before things get too emotional for him, Shirogani shows up with a large dinner. She serves everything and feeds it to Shirogan, making Narumi jealous of the bond she quickly developed with Masaru. While she feeds the little boy, Narumi sees the beautiful look on Shirogan's face and instantly falls in love with her. Nevertheless, he acts like the chill dude he is and just focuses on the mission ahead. After dinner, Masaru hits the shower and takes a bath. Shirogane, however, remembers Masaru's injured arm and knows she had to help him wash his back so he doesn't hurt the hand again. She enters the same shower entirely naked and ignores Masaru's prying eyes so she can wash him up. Around that time, Narumi also got the feeling to help Masaru wash as well. Without thinking, he rushes over to the bathroom and walks in on Shirogane washing little Masaru. There's an awkward silence as Narumi stares in shock at Shirogane's, you know what? Eventually, he falls to the ground and begs for Shirogane's mercy. Little did they know that they were being watched by a bunch of creeps. After getting scolded by Shirogane, Narumi steps outside to calm himself by practicing some of his martial arts. Masaru, after taking his bath, steps outside and gets fascinated by Narumi's moves. He asks Narumi about it, and Narumi tells him he learned everything he knows in China during a spiritual journey. On hearing this, Masaru gets emotional again and asks Narumi to tell him how he can be strong like him. Narumi stays silent and thinks of what he can do to help. Eventually, he thinks of something embarrassing and decides to show Masaru. In the next scene, Narumi takes Masaru to his room and shows him a picture book filled with embarrassing pictures taken from when he was younger. Masaru, who's surprised over seeing how scrawny and weak Narumi once was, bursts into laughter and forgets his sorrows for one night. Narumi pets him and tells him to keep on laughing forever so he doesn't die on time. To help him, he suggests teaching Masaru some of his martial arts moves so he can protect himself next time. Just as Masaru is about to answer him, Shirogane opens the door again with one of Narumi's shirts on. Narumi is dumbstruck at the little space between Shirogane's legs. He apologizes for the previous incident, but then Shirogane tells Narumi not to worry too much about what happened, as it happens quite often in the circus. Then, she turns to Masaru and tells him to come over to bed. Before leaving, Masaru makes Narumi promise to always stay by his side and make sure he doesn't leave him as his mother did. Later that night, Narumi thinks about his decision to teach Masaru martial arts and wonders if that'll be the right idea for him. In the end, he decides he's pretty attached to Masaru now, so there's nothing he can do but teach him. Seconds later, Masaru gets up and heads into the bathroom to pee and wash up. While he's at it, the puppeteer creeps stalking the trio earlier that night and finally makes their move. They control one of their puppets to abduct Masaru. When Narumi and Shirogani hear Masaru's screams, it is already too late, as the puppet already has its hand on him. All efforts to get their boy back proved futile as both Narumi and Shirogani were beaten up by the assassin's men. As the men leave the premises, the assassin boss, who calls himself Irio Ashihana from earlier, shows up and proposes a small truce between them as they now have a common enemy. He calls Masaru's abductors his rival team and lets them know that while their team's mission was to kidnap Masaru, his team was sent to kill him. Narumi gets a little restive, but then Aerio makes him know that they're being paid to do their jobs. He goes into further detail and tells the duo that they're all from the same clan. At the moment, the clan is split into two factions, and the kidnap team is being sent towards the Saiga Villa in Karuizawa to meet the client who wanted him. He tells them to tag along with him if they want to see Masaru again as he is heading to the villa at that moment. After much persuasion, Narumi and Shirogane finally agreed to come along. Before leaving, however, Aerio lets them know that the Heinous mansion is covered by puppet traps, so they'd better be careful. Elsewhere, Masaru keeps praying to be saved by his protectors, but he isn't fully aware of the world of hurt he was about to enter. The following morning, Narumi and Shirogane suit up and get ready to head over to the Saiga mansion to save Masaru. Before they leave, Shirogane stops Narumi and asks him to tell her why he's risking so much to save a little boy, as she knows people would often stick their noses out of conflict just to save their skin. Before Narumi could give his answer, a little boy ran in front of them and tripped on a stone. The pain from the fall makes him cry so much that he rushes to hug his mother. After witnessing that, Narumi smiles and tells Shirogani not to worry too much about him and to hop on the bike so they can get there sooner and rescue Masaru. Meanwhile, Masaru wakes up on a plush bed and finds a maid attending to him. When she's done, he gets up and turns around to find his uncle, Zenji Saiga, sitting on a chair close to the bed with a weird smile on his face. Zenji introduces himself as the good guy and tells Masaru not to worry about Shirogane and Narumi, mentioning that they're the bad guys in the entire story. Masaru feels a little uncomfortable while talking to this man and finds a way to get off the bed. Sadly, Zenji wasn't about to let him go. Just right outside the villa, 
Aerio and his men lie and wait for their rival team to get into the villa before they make their move. To their dismay, however, they find Narumi and Shirogane riding the motorcycle straight into the rival team's location. Narumi rides the bike into the rival team and beats down any one man enough to challenge him. Shirogane sneaks past them with her puppet and leaves Narumi to take down the rest. Also, Aerio sees his chance to slip past the rival team and he orders his men to get past the enemy lines so they can enter the villa unscathed. Within seconds, Aerio and his slaughter team beat down a big bunch of the rival team members, forcing the ones nearest to the Karakuri gates to get in as quickly as they could. Shirogane sees her chance to enter the gates, but unfortunately for her, the gatekeeper, who is a woman sitting atop the fence, closes the gates and dares anybody to get through. Just then, one of Aerio's men thoughtlessly ran to the gate and tried to bash it. Sadly, for him, the gatekeeper activated the traps in the gate and crushed him with them. After watching a man turn into a red puddle, Shirogane steps forward with a determined countenance and destroys the gate with Arlequin. Some of Aerio's men immediately ran inside the gate and failed to notice the bombs the gatekeeper's puppet had in its hands. She throws a few bombs at the men and stops the others in their tracks. Back in the mansion, Masaru refuses to eat his Omuris, as he feels his uncle might have tried to poison him. Zenji notices this and gets up from his seat to talk to his nephew. He tells Masaru not to worry about those trying to end him and steal his fortune, and instead place his trust in him so he can protect and nurture him. At this point, Masaru knows Zenji's lying to him and quietly plans his escape. To do this, he excuses himself and heads over to the bathroom by the end of the hall. On getting there to the dining hall's exit, Masaru realizes that his uncle had followed him. Scared for his life, Masaru kicks his uncle in the nuts and runs for dear life. In the meantime, Aryo tries to warn the gatekeeper, Takami, to be wary of Shirogane and her puppets. Takami's pride didn't let her heed the warning, so she attacked Shirogane blindly. Shirogane saw through her attacks and controlled her puppets to collect all of Takami's bombs. After getting all of them, she throws them back at Takami and blows her up alongside her puppet. Meanwhile, Masaru gets as far away from his uncle as possible and hides in one of the abandoned rooms his father used to use. Unfortunately for him, Zenji followed him there. Masaru stays in the hiding place, praying for a miracle to happen. Just then, he finds one of his dad's diaries and picks it up to read. To his surprise, he finds his name there and wonders what it is doing there. Outside, Narumi picks a fight with Aerio over his involvement in the dreadful clan seeking to end Masaru's life. After getting himself separated from the fight, Aerio introduces his clan as the Kuroga clan, which is one that used to dance with their puppets for the deities a long time ago. At around that time in the mansion, Masaru finds out from his father's diary that he was willed the entire empire to be used as bait for the Kuroga clan. His father knew that if Masaru was given the entire empire, then the Kuroga clan would be split in half to search for and kill each other from the inside out. As they make their way to the building, Narumi asks Aryo why the clan is now looking to kill a young boy. Aryo tells him that the Kuroga clan used to pay the Saiga family to make puppets for them, but now the Saiga family pays them huge amounts of money to test their weapon-like puppets when the time comes. In a few seconds, Aerio and his people split up and head in a different direction. Narumi and Shirogane run over a trapdoor, which opens up the second they set foot on it, and pulls Shirogane into the pit underneath it. Luckily for her, Narumi was quick enough to notice what was happening and react fast enough to grab her arm before she fell to her death. Just as he's about to pull her up, a panic Zonifa attack comes and weakens his hold on the ground. Before he can recuperate himself, he loses his grip and falls into the well with Shirogane. Zenji finally finds Masaru and beats the hell out of the little boy. Before he delivers the final blow, Zenji receives a call from one of his subordinates telling him about Narumi and Shirogane's demise. Little did he know that both were still alive and well, as Narumi had saved both of them from the fall. After sustaining heavy injuries on his back, Narumi began to choke on his saliva as the Zonafa attack became violent. Shirogane offered to help out, but then since she couldn't bring herself to laugh, there was nothing she could do. Narumi gets very restive and begins to think of a quick solution to his current problem. He eventually thinks of something weird and decides to give it a try. Without thinking it through, he asks Shirogane out, and to his surprise, there was no laughter, meaning Shirogane had considered dating him. Narumi felt his heart throb so heavily that the panic attack subsided momentarily. Masaru, who was watching them in the pit from one of the cameras in the room, was glad to 
to see them alive, he suddenly feels the urge to give living one more try. So, he takes a fire extinguisher and releases it on Zenji's face to distract him a little bit before running towards the window to jump out of it. In the meantime, Shirogane narrates her terrible experience as a youngster to Narumi. Apparently, she was born to be a puppeteer and used to be named Eleonora. Ever since she learned to walk, read, and write, she's undergone rigorous training that made her into the puppeteer she is now. Narumi gets a little disgusted at Shirogane's low self-esteem and tells her to have a little more faith in herself. He reminds her of Masaru's smile and tells her to smile more just like she did when she was feeding Masaru dinner back then. After getting the carbon dioxide off his face, Zenji finds Masaru standing at the window of the highest building in the villa. He tried convincing Masaru to stop being stupid and get down so he doesn't kill himself. Masaru, however, was more than ready to become a man. He takes a leap of faith, jumps to the forest several feet below him, and lands on one of the enemies only to end up saving Aerio in the process. After taking out Aerio's enemy, Saiga Masaru looks Aerio dead in the eyes and makes him a proposition to join his side for a much bigger check. After hearing Masaru's offer, Aerio is left flabbergasted by the dreadful look in Masaru's eyes. Being someone who respects brave people, Aerio knows Masaru means business. He checks to confirm if Masaru jumped high up from the building's window and to his surprise realizes that Masaru is dead serious. He gets up and tells Masaru about their loyalty agreement with their clients and apologizes for not being able to take his generous offer as it would mean betraying their initial client. Masaru, who's hell-bent on changing Aerio's mind, shows him his father's diary and lets him read the part where his dad and the other higher-ups in the Saiga family plan to make the Kuroga clan fight and kill each other. This eye-opener makes Aerio switch sides and reconsider Masaru's offer. Deep underground, Narumi and Shirogani, who were busy looking for a way into the mansion, ran into one of the enemies, who just finished planting two time bombs beneath the mansion, and another one of Zenji's men, who was also fighting him. With only one hour left on the timer, the enemy dude says his last prayers and waits for Zenji's man to end him with his deadly puppets. All Narumi and Shirogani could do was watch the scene unfold before them. Upstairs, Zenji receives a phone call from one of his men telling him Masaru's still alive and is coming for him with Irio's team. Before he can hang up the phone, Masaru shows shows up with Irio and his puppet to confront Zenji. Upon entering the room, he finds his uncle staring at Shirogane and Narumi as his man traps them in his strings on the big screen and begs him to let them go. Zenji takes advantage of the opportunity and tries to negotiate a deal with Masaru. He tells Masaru he's going to order his man to release his friends only if he can agree to be his legal ward. Masaru agrees to Zenji's terms and waits for the man to release his friends. Zenji orders his man to release Shirogan and Narumi and then place them in a dungeon for later. After after that, he then leads Masaru out of the room. Aerio, who can sense the debauchery going on, stops Masaru from making the gravest mistake of his life and tells him to think about what Zenji is going to do to his friends after he signs the adoption papers. Masaru is being cheated here, and Aerio wanted him to know it. Just then, Masaru stops moving and asks Zenji if he truly is going to let them go. Without any iota of remorse, Zenji admits to Masaru that he's definitely going to try and kill his friends. Masaru gets so pissed that his body jumps on his own and punches Zenji to the ground. When he's done dealing with the crazy man, he jumps on top of Irio's puppet and urges him to get on it too so they can jump off the building to the next and avoid getting blown to bits by the blast. At that moment, Masaru made Irio jump from the roof of the building that was about to blow up to the nearest one. Irio was a little skeptical about making the risky jump, but then again, his life was also in danger so he had no choice. Together, they made a leap of faith and managed to land at the edge of the building. To make a full landing, Masaru had to take control of the puppet and use its special function to land it safely on the building. Masaru and Aerio rushed to the dungeons and found his friends chilling inside it. The four of them have a little discussion, and Aerio faints shortly. Moments after he faints, Zenji's man shows up and threatens to collect Masaru's head if he doesn't let him kill Shirogane and Narumi. Masaru stands in front of the cell and buys Narumi enough time to power himself up and do some miracles or something. When the time is right, Narumi and enhances his powers with spiritual energy and breaks himself out of the cage he was put in. Then, he heads into the room beyond the dungeon and beats the living hell out of every enemy there. All Shirogani and Masaru could do was watch the awesome Narumi become a tiger for a short while and beat down every one of them. At one point in the fight, Shirogani's legs give out and she gets crippled for a little while. Narumi gets a little distracted and gets himself captured by Tamaki. With both his protectors down, Masaru tries to run away again like a scared little boy. However, 
However, he stops midway and returns to take control of Arlequin, Shirogane's puppet. His friends tried begging him to leave the lady alone, but then Masaru wasn't a little man anymore. With acute precision and skills, Masaru controls Arlequin and destroys Tamaki's puppet. That instant, the bomb underneath the nearest building blows up and takes Zenji out. The resulting explosion also shook the house Narumi and Shirogane were in, and started a fire. To make sure nobody's hurt, Aerio makes a ropeway and urges Narumi and the others to get through it if they want to survive. Narumi checks to make sure the rope is fine. Then, he ties Shirogane to the ropeway and makes her go to the safer side. Just then, the floor under Masaru's feet gives out and he falls through it. Narumi has a Zonafa panic attack at that time and begs Shirogane, who's just about to go, to forgive herself for not being able to laugh and instead focus on reaching the other side safely. After pushing her down the ropeway, Narumi gets down to Masaru's level and wraps his body around him as the entire house goes up in flames. Masaru begs Narumi to let him go, but then again, Narumi, the hero, isn't about to just let Masaru go. Masaru cries as he watches large logs of wood fall on Narumi's back. Nonetheless, Narumi tells him to stay true to himself and make sure he always smiles in times of adversity. Masaru falls asleep a little while later and wakes up the next day in the debris to find himself wrapped around Narumi's right arm. When he looked around to find the rest of Narumi's body, he found nothing but rubble and debris all around him. This led Masaru to believe that his hero, Narumi, had lost his life in the fire. Eventually, he was saved by the rescue team and taken back to his mansion. About two months later, Masaru wakes up on a bright morning and gets ready for his first day in school. He opens his windows and lets the morning air sink into his dermis as he reminisces over Narumi's memories. After two months of his hero's passing, Masaru felt he was okay enough to get back to school. He heads downstairs to get some breakfast and is served by Shirogane, who got all over him to make sure he was fully ready to return to school. Eventually, Masaru gets a little freaked out by her getting all over him and begs her to leave him be. Shirogane gets back inside the house and prepares herself for school that day. At the door, Masaru asks Shirogane if she will be attending the same school as he is, but then Shirogane tells him she's registered at the school next to him, under the Saiga name. This is so she can keep a close eye on Masaru and still let him live his life with ease. Soon after, the car shows up to pick them up and take them to school, but then Masaru holds Shirogane's hands and walks to school with her. On the way, he smiles at the wonderful Shirogan and strides courageously. Moments before arriving at school, Shirogane stops Masaru to talk to him about bullying. From what she heard, Masaru used to be bullied in school from way back for being a bastard child who was lucky to be born with a silver spoon. She then gives Masaru a piece of advice, telling them to try and avoid standing out of the crowd so as not to attract unwanted attention from the students. Masaru gives her words a little thought, but then gets confused when nothing makes sense to him. Eventually, they continued their journey and arrived at Masaru's school in a few moments. At the gate, three of Masaru's lifelong bullies spot their prey, coming back to school and get excited over the horrible things they're going to do to Masaru after classes. Shirogane reminds Masaru to never forget to call her if he gets into trouble before walking back to her school. Moments after getting to school, Masaru goes to get his shoes from his locker. Upon getting to his locker, he finds it empty. This could only mean the bullies had done something to prevent him from getting his shoes on time. Masaru smiles and walks to class barefoot, leaving the bullies confused as to why he is smiling. They promise to make him cry before the end of the day so they can satisfy their inner desires to bully him. Meanwhile, Masaru gets to his class and finds embarrassing pictures of himself begging the bullies to change his diapers. Rather than cry his heart out, he commends the bully's drawing and gets back to his seat calmly as the teacher enters the class to start the lecture. This time, the bullies get a little worried about their prey. What happened to him during his overseas travels because he seems slightly different from his usual self? At the time lectures began, Shirogane got to his class's window to spy on Masaru. The bullies didn't stop there as they tried dropping tacks on Masaru's chair and even throwing wet diapers on his head in class. Still, Masaru didn't break his act. By the end of class, the bullies approached Masaru and threw him to the ground. At this point, the class president, Ori, couldn't take it anymore and she got up from her seat to confront Kajiyama, the leader of the bullies. Shirogane stands and watches from the window side as she contemplates the best course of action. She eventually decides to sit still and watch how the scene plays out. The bullies try to bully Ori, but then Masaru gets back up and politely asks Ori to keep herself out of his business. Ori gets pissed at Masaru and tells him to stop kissing the bully's feet. It was then that Kajiyama punched Masaru's face and exposed the scar on his forehead that he had previously covered with a bandana. Upon seeing the horrible scar on his forehead, everyone recoils in shock as they realize just how much Masaru suffered. Masaru decided it was high time he got off his act and showed everyone who he truly was. Just then, he removes his shirt and shows all of 
of his scars to his friends. Everyone, including the bully, immediately feels sorry for Masaru and whatever he passed through during his travels. Masaru narrates his entire experience, and also mentions the man who saved him from his former self, Narumi. Shirogane, after seeing what happened, returns to her school and gets scolded by her teacher for leaving school on her first day. In another part of town, Mr. Nakamachi, a circus owner, and his two sons face their landlord, who is tired of them, owing over a year's rent. He lets out his concerns and tells Mr. Nakamachi to give up on the circus so he can move on with life. Sadly, this advice didn't sit well with Mr. Nakamachi, and he threw a fit that almost knocked down the landlord. During PE practice, Orie sits with Masaru and asks him about the person who saved him. Masaru tells her all he knows about Shirogane and the late Narumi. He tells her that he's pretty sure Shirogane is doing her best to be the best in everything, and he wasn't wrong at all. Shirogane excelled at every subject possible — history, math, and cooking. And even during PE, she beat their star gymnast with a wonderful performance. Everyone, including the star gymnast herself, is amazed at how flexible her body is. Masaru continues to tell Shirogane's story to Orie. Apparently, her inability to laugh was something that haunted her, and she blamed a part of herself for not laughing when she was supposed to and causing Narumi's death. During one of his moments, Orie interrupts him and asks about the next circus Shirogane is going to join. Masaru tells her Shirogane isn't in a circus for now, but then Orie tells him to let her join one. Masaru, who's been searching for a way to get Shirogane to forget Narumi in the meantime, sees this as an absolute win, and he gets ready to get her into a circus in no time. Meanwhile, Mr. Nakamachi and his two boys get tired of cleaning the landlord's house and wonder why children nowadays are into video games and TV instead of enjoying the circus. Just then, Shirogane and Masaru arrive at the ragged building to join Mr. Nakamachi's circus. Mr. Nakamachi hears them talking about joining the circus and immediately welcomes them to join the circus. His boys show up a while later and show off their skills to Masaru. Masaru then asks Shirogane to show off her skills to the man and his kids, and Shirogane manages to wow everyone in the room. After doing her wonderful performance, she checks to make sure Masaru is okay with her joining. Masaru tells her he's okay with her joining, and Mr. Nakamachi officially welcomes her to the circus team. In a dark room somewhere, Narumi's body is seen quietly beaming with life as the EKG monitor monitors his heart rate. This could only mean that someone rescued poor Narumi and saved him before Masaru woke up that morning after the incident. A few days later, Narumi is seen in a maximum security hospital undergoing special treatment with a particular substance his doctor called Aqua Vitae. After administering the last drops of the substance, the doctor instructs Narumi's body to rise from the ashes and provide the assistance he needs. A month later, Narumi wakes up and finds himself fighting a bunch of puppets for fun. He tries to retrace his last memory before his sleep and keeps on seeing Shirogane, the crying girl, and Masaru, the kid with a bright smile, and wonders who they are. Judging by the looks of things, Narumi had lost his memory before that point and had no idea what or who he was before the incident. Moments after waking up, Narumi looks around the room and finds a weird white-haired man standing next to him. The man keeps on yapping about Narumi's feelings and boring him out. Just then, Narumi asks the man to tell him where he is, and the man tells him he's currently in a high-security hospital in Illinois, USA. Upon hearing this, Narumi gets a little worried and gets up from his bed, utterly confused and worried about his real identity. The man treating him reminds him of his name Narumi Kato, and also introduces himself as a descendant of the French aristocracy and connoisseur of all that's beautiful guy Christophe Rec. He then moves on to introduce the witch-like lady sitting across the room as Lucille Verneuil. Before Narumi could say anything, a nurse, Miss Helen, shows up to check up on Narumi. Guy immediately frolics around the girl, causing her to be a little bit embarrassed. Narumi gets up from the bed and reprimands Guy for acting weirdly around the girl, and makes him promise not to do that ever again. Moments after he's done, Narumi looks behind him and finds a blonde kid peeking into the hospital room he was kept in. Narumi tried to say hi, but then the little boy got scared and ran for his life. Narumi followed him through the hospital's corridor and went into another room. There, he finds some kids sitting at a small center table and scares them with his rude appearance. To quell the tension in the room, Narumi's body moves on its own and performs some of his martial arts moves in front of the kids. Narumi gets a little confused at his own body movements, but then again, the dramatic display seemed to work in his favor and the kids loved it. Before he knows it, the kids all flock around him to commend his impressive moves. Just 
just then, the blonde kid who ran from him earlier, Mark, gets a zone of a panic attack, and Miss Helen from before rushes in with a smile on her face to ease the tension in Mark's facial muscles and parasympathetic nervous system. After witnessing the attack, Narumi suddenly remembers his panic attacks and faints. The next time he wakes up, he finds himself in another room with a few more doctors alongside Guy and his mother, Lucille. Guy reprimands Narumi for going against his orders and putting his life in danger. He then moves on to narrate how he found him in the rubble. Apparently Guy was in Japan to scout Narumi but then found him unconscious with only one arm left on him. He then took him in and flew him back to the USA to undergo treatment with the Aqua Vitae. Moving on, Narumi asks Guy about the kid earlier, and the doctor near Guy tells him about the facility. So the heavily guarded facility currently houses and caters to about 2,000 children with the Zonafa syndrome. Narumi keeps his mouth shut to think about what he just heard. Meanwhile, the doctor and his subordinates tried to chase Guy and his mother away from the hospital as they didn't like them there. Sadly for them, Guy and his mother still had some business in their hospital before they could leave, and the lead doctor left them to it. After he's gone, Narumi thanks Guy for saving his life and then asks him why he brought him to the US this time. Lucille and Guy advise him to regain his strength so that he can fully understand why when he's back to normal. From then on, Narumi made sure to eat well, sleep well, and play well with the kids just so he could get his affairs back in order as quickly as possible. One day, while drawing pictures with the kids, Narumi finally bonds with Mark and manages to also make a funny gorilla face to make Beth laugh. By the end of the day, Narumi leaves the kids and heads back to his hospital room. On his way there, he hears someone crying in the drugstore room and stops to go check out the person. On getting there, he finds Miss Helen shedding tears as she throws some pills in her mouth. Before he could think of anything, two other male doctors approach the room. Narumi hides out of sight to make sure nobody sees him. The male doctors walked in on Helen choking in excitement on some drugs and joined her. Narumi gets back to the door and finds everyone abusing the drug supply in the hospital. The very next day, Narumi rushes over to the head senior doctor's office to report what he saw to him. To his surprise, the head doctor tells him that they're only doing what's necessary to continue doing their job so there's no big deal at that. Narumi ignores the man and instead, focuses on what's going on beyond the mirror in front of him instead. There, he found the witch, Lucille, interrogating Mark like he was a criminal and asked the senior doctor what was going on. The senior doctor tells him, without remorse, that Guy and Lucille were only trying to get information about the little boy's parents, and that information was going to help take down the automata. Narumi gets pissed and breaks the glass open from the other. Then, he kicks Guy and condemns the doctors for taking drugs to do their jobs. Just then, Narumi checks out the pieces of glass stuck in his hand and notices them getting pushed out of his hand as his hands start healing themselves slowly. After calming himself down, Narumi allows the doctors to come take Mark away. Just outside the corridor, Miss Helen shows up and tells Narumi the truth about the entire matter. Apparently, the Zonafa syndrome is still a mystery to many, and not much research has been done about it. The little research they could do at the moment wasn't getting any good results, and the doctors need to keep a smiley face for the kids so that they can help them whenever their Zonafa attacks return. Now, keeping a smiley face is not as easy as it seems, so the doctors resorted to taking drugs just so they can smile more. After letting Helen speak, Guy inches closer to Narumi and breaks the real nature of the hospital to him. A few kilometers away from the hospital, a part of the Automata gang, Palman, and his puppet, and Selmus walk to the hospital with a few other puppets to wreak havoc on the hospital. In the meantime, the senior doctor takes Narumi to the intensive care unit for the Zonafa patients just so he can see the true nature of the weird illness. On getting there, Narumi finds dozens of kids breathing with ventilators on their noses. Apparently, the second stage causes the immune system to fail dramatically, and as a result, patients suffering from this stage are made to breathe through ventilators, and those who are lucky enough to die in this process don't have to pass through the third most heart wrenching stage of the illness. Narumi asks the senior doctor to tell him what the final stage of the illness is, and the senior doctor takes him to the basement level of the hospital via a service elevator. On getting there, Narumi is faced with the most terrible thing no human should ever be made to see. At the final stage of the illness, the children can't die anymore, but then the syndrome gets so severe that their body temperatures drop below normal and their muscles remain rigid, leaving them immobile forever. At this stage, beds are useless, and there's almost nothing that can be done to save the kids again. Narumi loses every tincture of pride in his body and asks Guy why and how he cured his Zonafa syndrome. Guy responds by telling him that he used the mysterious substance called Aqua Vitae to cure it and only cured him because he needed his power for something else. Narumi asks if he could mass produce the drug and administer it to the kids. Sadly, there wasn't that much left and knowledge on how to
to create it has been lost to history. Moving on, Guy tells Narumi about the Automata, which is an elite group of criminals who made it their life's mission to spread the Zonafa syndrome and infect people with it just to fulfill their crazy desires and fetishes. Currently, they're being commanded by a group called the Midnight Circus and are unstoppable. Now that Narumi's there, Guy wants him to become a Shirogani and join their fight against the Automata. Narumi, upon hearing the name Shirogani, gets a headache as some part of his memories flash back into his head. Just then, the Automata guys, Palman and his puppets, arrive at the facility to hunt and harvest human blood. Guy heads outside with his Shirogani puppet and holds them off while the doctors take the kids somewhere safe. Narumi holds Beth and watches the fight go on from the floor above. Just then, Beth has the attack and begs Narumi to make the gorilla face for her so she can laugh while she still can. With tears on his face, Narumi makes a face and watches her freeze up and pass out. He cries bitterly and cusses Guy for using what's left of the Aqua Vitae on him. Lucille tells him not to underestimate himself as he proves useful to the world more than a few kids. She then hands him a mask and tells him to wear it in the meantime so he can hide his identity. Filled with rage, Narumi heads on to the battlefield and takes down as many puppets as he can. After taking down the puppets, Anselmus and his master, Palman, commend Narumi for his work and then send more of their puppets to attack him. Narumi gets his body ready to take on multiple enemies and ends up beating down every single one of them. While he's at it, he asks himself why he fights and eventually realizes that he fights only for the kids and nobody else. With this realization, Narumi strengthens his fists and beats down the last puppet. Just then, Palman releases his valuable puppet, Anselmus, to fight Narumi. Anselmus rotates his body at a very high speed and manages to land several cuts over Narumi's body. He then returns to his master's position and leaves the rest to Palman. Palman happily activates his hidden puppet powers and lunges at Narumi. Around that time, Guy reminds Narumi to turn the switch on his shoulder so he can take out his blade and defend himself. Narumi does so and ends up using the hidden blade in his shoulders to stop and pin Palman to the ground. Surprised, Palman asks him how he's still alive even after receiving multiple hits over his body. It was then that Narumi exposed the healing power he got from the Aqua Vitae and explained the special healing abilities his body now has. He's no longer a human by normal standards, and he calls himself a demon, whose mission is to hunt down the automata and end them all. After hearing all the terrifying things come out of Narumi's mouth, Palman activates his last resort and punctures Narumi with it to pin him down so Anselmus can attack him. Narumi bites down his shoulder blade and destroys Anselmus with it. Palman sees this and decides to escape being caught while he still has the chance. He activates the jet engine under his shoes and tries to escape Narumi's grasp. Sadly for him, Narumi wasn't ready to let him go just yet. As he flexed his muscles around the pincers, Paul Man attached to him and attached himself to it. Narumi makes sure Paul Man doesn't get anywhere to go so he can deal with him accordingly. He places Paul Man on the ground and, with acute precision and skills, obliterates the callous being. There and then, the battle ends with Narumi as the sole victor. He walks back to the kids to say hi to them, but then again, all the kids get scared of him after seeing what he did to those bad men. Narumi understands their plight and turns his back on them as well. Then, he walks over to Guy and Lucille and thanks them for scouting him to join their elite force. Before leaving the facility, he goes over to the doctors and begs them to work on finding a cure for the Zonafa syndrome while he's away, fighting the bad guys. Before he leaves, Tom, the quiet kid, calls out his name and runs over to his side to hug him. Narumi receives his hug and promises to become a stronger Shirogane so he can protect the children. By nightfall, everyone gathers in front of the travel truck to talk about their day doing business. Shirogane submits the cash she made that day performing for kids and gets down to eat some dinner. During dinner, Masaru asks Shirogane if anything special happened to her that day. Shirogane thinks back and tells him about the weird new friend she made at the park. Apparently, the assassin had a brother with terrible Zonafe syndrome and had been trying to raise money for the expensive treatment by throwing knives but still couldn't manage to save her poor brother from his demise. Shirogane looked very sad upon hearing that as she also remembered Narumi and his illness. This resonated with the assassin and she introduced herself as Vilma to Shirogane. At the time, Shirogane didn't know that her new friend was an assassin hired to kill Masaru. So that night, she finds a bunch of balloons she forgot to return to the park. She gets them and excuses herself to get to the park to return them, leaving Masaru hanging. Vilma, who's been hiding and waiting for her chance ever since abducts Masaru, and takes him to a secluded part of the woods to kill him. She throws some knives at him but then misses on purpose to scare him. Shirogane returns a few minutes later and realizes what had happened. She tracks Vilma 
and finds her somewhere, just as she's about to throw the next set of knives at Masaru. Surprised to see each other, the two friends exchange pleasantries and become enemies for the night. Shirogane takes out Arlequin and defends both herself and Masaru from Vilma's throwing knives. Vilma throws several throwing knives at Masaru, and Shirogane takes everything. At this point, Masaru was too sad to let the fight continue. He walks in front of Shirogane and gives her the Naruto talk of morals. This seems to work a little bit as Vilma remembers the look in Masaru's eyes to be like her brothers. Shirogane takes advantage of this and knocks her out. Once she's sure Vilma's down, she removes the knives stuck in her brain and shows Masaru her regenerative powers. Vilma gets back to fight again, but this time, Shirogane uses her Arlequin to knock her down. Moments before she passes out, Vilma remembers her final moments with her brother, just as he's about to die. Her little brother, Jim at the time, wanted her to perform a throwing knife trick before he died. Vilma tearfully throws a knife at the apple on his head and makes sure to make him happy. Jim died shortly after telling his sister to live on and be happy with his life. With this, she takes out another knife and aims it at Shirogane. Despite having a very clear shot, she still loses. The next time Vilma wakes up, she finds herself sleeping in the circus with the others. Shirogane's awake, so she asks her why she's still alive with them. Shirogane tells her it was Masaru's idea to keep her with them. Vilma, upon hearing this, decides to tease Shirogane a little bit, and almost ends up losing her head. However, Shirogane keeps her cool, and recalls some of the important events that happened in her life with Masaru and Narumi. Moments after knocking Vilma down, Shirogane gave Masaru some of her blood to drink so he could be stronger and more protected from injuries and diseases. Shirogane makes a better speech to Vilam, and manages to convert her to be on their side. The next morning, Vilma joins the circus group and relinquishes her former mission to kill Masaru. To raise money for their circus, Nakamachi and the others head over to a Beach Queen contest to compete against a few other circuses and earn the prize money. Shirogane Shirogane impresses the judges well enough to win the prize money. Before handing the money over to her, the MC hands over the mic to Shirogane and asks her to tell them what she plans on doing with the prize money. Shirogane tells him she will share it with her family, the Nakamachi Circus. To end her performance, she invites every member of the Nakamachi Circus to the stage and introduces them as the soon-to-be most popular circus in the country. A few days pass and it's opening day for the Nakamachi Circus. Moments before opening, Masaru checks up on their beast tamer, Lise, and asks her why she only tames dogs and cats. Lise gets sad and tells him she used to tame a tiger back in the day, but then the tiger went rogue and killed her sister. Since then, she stepped down from taming wild beasts and prefers taming cats and dogs. Masaru sympathizes with her and cheers her up by encouraging her to perform well in the circus. Lise gets fired up and promises to put on a good show at the circus. Happy to see she's not being controlled by her lust for revenge, Masaru smiles and keeps cheering her. In the next scene, Narumi is seen sleeping in an airplane traveling over to Japan with Lucille and Guy. During their flight, two kids play around and throw their ball to Guy. Scared for their life, they beg Guy to hand over the ball to them, and he does so in a menacing way which scares the kids away. Just then, a man from the seat across gets a little kinky. The air hostess asks if he's fine, but then the man smiles and transforms into an automata Karakuri puppet. Soon, the whole plane is filled with them. Narumi and his people get a little flustered, but then they hold themselves together to play the automata's game. One of the automata puppets tells them they can only win the game if the plane lands safely, but they shouldn't expect things to go very easily, as they also will try their possible best to crash the plane. Narumi gets super pissed at them for scaring everybody on board and attacks the leader without thinking. The leader lets himself get punched in the stomach so the explosive there can be detonated and he can blow up a part of the plane. Well, his plan works, and soon enough, there's a hole in the plane, and it starts losing altitude. One of the automata puppets finds its way to the cockpit and hijacks the plane from the pilots. Meanwhile, Narumi and his people struggled to keep the plane under control as they knew they were losing altitude fast. The automata puppets in the plane clear the chairs in the economy section of the plane to create a playing field for them to begin their fight with the new Shirogane, Narumi. If Narumi can beat them all, the plane will safely land in Shanghai. Otherwise, the plane will crash. To make things more interesting, one of the automata puppets holds a kid's hand and promises to break a finger each time Narumi gets hit by one of them. Guy laughs at the brilliant idea and offers his fingers to be broken rather than the kid's own. Luckily for him, the automata believe him, and they take his fingers up to be broken. After settling things with Guy, Narumi gets down to fighting the Automata dudes. In the early stages of the fight, he gets hit by one of the puppets, and Guy has one of his fingers broken. Lucky for Guy, he doesn't feel pain like humans do, so he tells Narumi to have his fun. Narumi goes into the fight and endures searing pain from the Automata while the passengers watch. In the meantime, another one of the Automata puppets plays around with Lucille's walking stick 
and fiddles around with it. While Lucille orders the puppet to hand it back, the puppet gloats and tells her about the detachment force that overtook the cockpit and is about to crash the plane. Then it stabs Lucille's hand with her staff and pins it to the chair in front of her, leaving her there to suffer. Lucille, however, knows she has to get herself out of the bondage she's in if she's to help save the passengers and the plane from crashing. Narumi, on the other hand, finds a little kid crying and worrying over Guy's broken fingers while fighting the automata. He shifts over to the kid's side and swears to keep Guy safe. With that, Lucille also makes it to the cockpit and safely destroys the automata puppet there without setting off the bomb in its belly. After taking care of the puppet, she takes over the controls of the plane and starts flying it to the nearest island as they are over the ocean. In the meantime, Narumi uses his hidden blade to stab the automata and prevent it from sucking the blood from the kids. Moments before the boss explodes, Guy controls his Shirogani puppet and wraps it around the boss so it explodes inside it. Thankfully, this works just fine and the plane's left unaffected. Narumi heaved a sigh of relief, thinking they were out of the blue already. Guy tells him to look outside the plane, and when he does, he finds hundreds of insectoid automata flying very close to the engine. When the time is right, they all begin crashing and blowing the plane engines. Lucille's voice appears over the intercom, and she tells the men to get ready to fight the bug automata outside the plane. Guy prepares his puppet's engine so he can fly it outside and take down the bug automata. He makes sure to tell the scared kid to muscle up and hold his dear sister tight so no harm happens to her. Elsewhere, Masaru and his people finally get customers for the grand opening of their circus show. While that goes on, Guy attaches himself to his puppet and flies outside to take care of the bug automata. The leader of the plague wraps Guy with his insectoid automata and prepares himself to take Guy down. When Guy sees his chance, he breaks himself out of the swarm and damages the boss of the swarm. Knowing fully well that he's going to die, the boss of the fleet flies towards the last engine so he can crash into it and destroy the plane. Guy clearly can't let this happen on his watch. So he takes the guy and flies him to the water. Just then, Lucille tells Narumi to do something about the pests on the left wing and prepare for an emergency crash landing. Narumi does what he can and holds the passengers to brace themselves so they can crash on the nearest island. By sheer luck, Narumi's plane crashes into the island near Shirogani's circus. Shirogan, upon hearing the loud crash, rushes outside to check out what happened. On getting there, she spots Narumi's silhouette and immediately jumps on the plane to find him. Sadly, Narumi wasn't outside yet as he was in the cockpit fighting the automata, placing Lucille under under hostage. He punches the puppet out the window and leaves the puppet inside spilling out. Now desperate for human blood, the puppet sticks out its syringe to suck out some human blood. Thankfully, Shirogane was there to save one of the victims. Narumi shows up shortly and saves Shirogane from a near-death experience. After placing her close to Masaru, he sneaks under the cover of the dust and escapes the scene before Shirogane and Masaru can sense him. Masaru and Shirogane get up as quickly as they can and run around the dust mist to find Narumi, all to no avail. Hours Years later, Masaru and Shirogani return to the circus camp to cater for the wounded. Shirogani finds her former teacher, Guy, lying unconscious in the rubble. She rushes towards him and tries to wake him up as he is covered in wounds. Thankfully, Guy wasn't dead yet, but then again, he needed treatment quickly. Masaru leaves Shirogani to cater for her former boss. By nightfall, Shirogan comes out of Guy's tent after spending the whole day there. Masaru sees her and asks about her relationship with Guy from back then. Shirogan begins her story and tells Masaru that Guy was the first person to ever take her in from the streets. Back then, Guy took her to an old wretched building in France to teach her the kinks of puppeteering. Shirogani learned her skills from the old witch and became the person she was. After hearing all Shirogan had to say, Masaru moves on to talk about Narumi's silhouette that he saw in the dust mist back when the plane crashed on their circus. He also says that the thought of Narumi being alive and well has been on his mind for hours now. To calm him down, Shirogane holds his head and puts it against her heart so he can hear it beat. She tells him about the sound of her heart and says it's beating that way because of the way Narumi cared for her when he was alive. Masaru, upon hearing these words, asks Shirogani if she likes Narumi secretly. On hearing this, Shirogani's face blushes red from embarrassment. Thankfully, Masaru was still too innocent to understand what just happened, so Shirogani gets away with it. Later that night, Masaru has a nightmare about the incident that took Narumi's life. He woke up screaming and found the others sleeping. From the looks of things, Masaru has been having such dreams ever since
since Narumi died. He looks around the room and finds Shirogani sitting quietly on the floor. Then, he gets very sore and blames himself for acting like a kid when the other people around him are so strong and take care of their past like adults. To find himself, he packs his bag and decides to find out the real reason why his father willed his entire property to him, a little child. He leaves his circus and heads towards an unknown place to find himself. Several miles away, Narumi, Lucille, and one other girl, Mingxia, head deep into the forests of China to search for the Midnight Circus and destroy it. Now Mingxia is the daughter of the person who taught Narumi martial arts back. Narumi and Lucilla had already gone to his dojo earlier that day to search for him, but they met Mingxi, who told them about the terrible Zonapa syndrome her father contracted. She advises them to find her father if they wish to find the Midnight Circus. Ever since then, Narumi, Lucille, and Mingxia, who decided to tag along, have been trekking through the forest searching for a clue. After trekking for a dozen kilometers, Narumi has a flashback to his past, about someone named Francis. Scene. He reacts to the memory and all that, but then again, he ignores his pain and keeps moving. Apparently, memories of the soul of the creator of the Aqua Vitae healing mix were flooding his head for the past few days, and Narumi didn't know what to do about it. Moments after having the flashbacks, Narumi and his people finally catch up to Master Liang, aka Narumi's kung fu teacher. This time they find him having a Zonafa attack. Narumi quickly recognizes the panic attacks and laughs out loud in front of Liang. This seemed to calm him down a little bit, and then he was able to speak up. When he does, he tells everyone about the terrible thing his ancestors created that led to the creation of this terrible disease. He then mentions the water of life, aka Aqua Vitae, and tells Narumi that that was the invention that brought havoc and strife to the land. Just then, Narumi spills out everything he's been through up to that point and ends up garnering his master's sympathy. Liang takes out a book and decides to tell him the origin story of the terrible Zonafa disease. A long time ago, two brothers from the Bai family, Yin and Jin, both young and vibrant, used to compete with each other, making puppets every chance they got. Narumi recognizes this story and realizes that one of the brothers' souls was what was made into the water of life. At a point in their life, they began to wonder how they could make their puppets move like humans. To figure out the answer, they traveled for eight years till they got to an alchemist in Prague, France, to learn the answer to their question. After settling down in Prague and becoming apprentices to the alchemist, the boys get around the city to get some equipment for their boss. On their way there, both Yin and Jin get stared at by the women in the town. Jin notices this and asks his serious-minded brother to consider talking to one or two. Yin bricks up and scolds his little brother for trying to embarrass him. He moves without noticing the beautiful young lady passing near them and bumps into her, spilling her basket of apples. Upon seeing how beautiful the lady is, both brothers are held aback. Yin helped her pick up her apples and found out her name was Francine. After the short introduction, the brothers returned to their master to learn the sacred art of alchemy. Then, on another day, the two of them ran into Francine again in the town. While Jin walked over to say hi, Yin stayed back and overheard two jealous girls bad-mouthing Jin for trying to steal away their Jin from them. When he's done talking to her, Jin rushes back to his brother and coerces him into joining the band for the circus. A few hours later, all three of them go to the circus to enjoy the circus and the jesters. When Francine finds out the brothers are from a family of puppeteers, she gets really surprised and takes them to do the puppet show. On getting there, they found out that the puppeteer was too drunk to handle the puppets. Both brothers turn back to move, but then Francine calls them and forces them to fill in for the puppeteer. Together, the brothers put on a really good show and made loads of money from the crowd that gathered. By nightfall, Yin carried his brother home as he was too drunk to walk. With his brother fast asleep, Yin tells Francine to keep the bread they bought with the money while he takes care of his brother. After dropping him at home, Yin escorted Francine back home. On getting to her house, Yin finds out how poor Francine is and finally understands why she was stealing bread from the circus show that day. He gets to spend most of the night there with Francine and her family watching them eat bread and play around. Then, Francine excuses herself and walks outside to get some air. Yin gets inquisitive and follows her outside to spy on her. There, he finds poor Francine lulling and catches her just as she's about to fall. Thankfully, he carries her and finds the mark of a thief on her back and asks her why she steals. When asked where her bread was, Francine told her she already shared it with some strangers. Annoyed, Yin takes Francine to get her bread back, but when they get there, 
he finds the two poor elderly people eating the bread Francine gave them. The lady senses Francine at the window and rushes over to say hi. However, she only met Yin there who asked her to tell her all she could about Francine. After telling the story, the old woman tearfully begged Yin to treat Francine better and make sure she's happy because she's their angel and deserves everything good in life. Ever since then, Yin changed and started considering Francine to be his spouse. One day, he spoke in parables to his brother and found out that Jin also fell in love with Francine. Being the spoiled brat Jin was, Yin couldn't bear to let him keep Francine. So, the next day, Jin goes to the church where Francine prays and finds her there. He asks about her philosophy on life, and Francine tells him the most beautiful things. This only strengthens his love for Francine, and our boy, our man, proposes to her that instant. Despite every excuse to get him to throw off his proposal, Jin still made sure to stand strong in his decision, and in the end, Francine agreed to marry him. Excited by the thought of it, Jin takes out a weird ring he had on him and places it on her finger. When he's done, he walks out of the church smiling with his bride-to-be, Francine. Little did he know that Yin was there in the church, eavesdropping on the entire conversation. Conversation. Almost immediately after they left the church, he raised his head and swore revenge against his brother for taking the love of his life. That night, Jin abducted Francine and left Prague and Yin all together. For years, Yin tried to find them, and after nine years of traveling and searching the lands endlessly, he finally found traces of them during spring. That day, Yin had found Jin's hideout and was thirsty for his blood. He rushed inside the Hideyut with a knife in his hand and threatened it to kill Jin for his crimes. To his surprise, however, Jin Krasili tells him not to bother trying to take Francine back as she's now his wife, and not his. Surprised, Yin takes back his knife and listens to his crazy little brother brother cry. When he's done crying, Jin asks Yin why he betrayed him and asked Francine out behind his back. He tells him about the church and lets him know that he heard everything he said to Francine at that point. Sad, Yin stops to think about the gravity of what he's done to his brother. If there's one thing he's sure of at this moment, it's that his little brother, Jin, isn't the same person anymore. After laughing like a maniac, Jin returns to his laboratory to show his brother the results of his research and tells him it'll be done very soon. He also blurts out one major thing that makes Yin's face light up with sorrow. Upon hearing this, Yin ran to the dungeon and found a small opening close to the ground covered in iron bars. He hears Francine's voice and rushes over to the entrance to say he to hear. Francine, who's more than happy to see the love of her life again, gets up for the first time in years and thanks their creator for bringing the love of her life back to her. She then gets up to touch him, but then the chains on her leg don't let her move freely. She explains the nature of her sickness to Yin and asks him to stay away from her so he doesn't contract her illness. Yin asks her to come close to him so he can examine, to which Francine does. He asks her to remove her clothes so he can examine her body closely and figure out what illness she has. While he does so, Francine asks him if he's seen Jin, and when Yin says yes, Francine begs him not to be too hard on Jin, as he is only acting on his feelings and all. Despite having her to himself, his soul hadn't been at ease for a long time, and she didn't like it at all. With this, Francine gets to the ground and curls up to the fatigue. A few seconds later, the villagers show up and restrain Yin from getting inside the dungeon without asking permission. After returning to Jin's mansion, Yin got to work and experimented with alchemy for months on end, till he finally created the soft stone for making aqua vitae. He rushes over to Francine's dungeon to administer the drug to her, but on getting there, he finds the entire place on fire. He tried to desperately save Francine from the burning shed, but unfortunately, he couldn't break her out. In her dying moments, Francine asks for forgiveness from their creator and Yin for betraying the love he had for her and staying with his wicked and jealous brother, Jin, for so long. After coming to peace with herself, she says her goodbyes to Yin and this world before letting herself get engulfed by flames. Before she turns to dust, she mouths some inaudible words to heartbroken Yin and waits for death's sad call. Yin returned home with an incurable sadness, holding nothing but a bunch of hair he was able to harvest from Francine. On his way home, he ran into his brother and handed the hair over to him. Before leaving him, he reminded him of Francine's love for him. If only Jin had forgiven himself for taking away his brother's wife, then maybe he too would have recognized Francine's love for him, and would have learned to accept life for what it truly is. After the meeting, the brothers' paths never crossed again until a whopping 23 years later. By that time, 
Jin was already an old lunatic who developed a knack for creating dolls over the years. That day, he'd just finished creating the first Francina modal and was about to give her the life-giving water, Aquavitae. After injecting the substance into her neck, Francina finally came to life. Jin decided to make her happy and smile by letting her witness jesters and clowns try to make her laugh. Sadly for him, Francina never laughed, not even once. To satisfy his urge for revenge, Jin created the Deedly Syndrome on a pay and passed it on to the villagers so they could suffer for caging his Francine and killing her before her time. At the time, Lucille was amongst the villagers who suffered from the terrible disease. To up Francine's chances of laughing, Jin made the clowns tear up the humans in the village. Even worse, he made sure to burn all their houses down to make sure Francine laughed. At one point in the battle, Lucille almost had her daughter, Angelina, taken away from her by Jin, but then she wasn't a weakling so she defended her daughter and saved her from certain death. Shortly after the incident, the villagers were already in the third stage of the Zonafa Syndrome, the part where they fail to die and are cursed to twitch and stay in one place till eternity. After six years of suffering, Yin finally returned with the Aquavitae and gave some to Lucille. After getting her and a few villagers back to normal, Yin takes Lucille to a well near the plain and tells her everything about Jin and the horrible things he did to her and the people. Then, he took out a soft stone and threw it into the well filled with water. This is so that the stone will dissolve in the water and turn it into the famous Aqua Vitae. Before letting her go, however, Yin gives Lucille the key to a certain chest of puppets and then calls himself Shirogani. He gives Lucille a mission to take down all of Jin's toys and make sure she incites the villagers to turn against Jin and destroy his automata. After she's gone, he then moves closer to the water and jumps into the well to merge his soul with the soft stone so he can preserve the water. Lucille returned a while later and opened the chest with the key. Upon opening it, however, a flood of knowledge and emotions, including a deep malice against the automata, entered her body. Ever since then, she's made it her life's mission to take down every single one of them. Pantalon tells them the rest of the story. Despite having tormented the villagers for bringing harm and havoc to his Francine, Jin was still disappointed to see that his Francine still didn't laugh. This didn't sit well with him as the lunatic strangled his doll and left the village. Strangely enough, Francine never died from Jin's attack, and she was able to distill her synthetic blood to create more automata. Master Liang talks smack about Francine, and then lets Pantalone attack him. Just when he's done with his stuff, Liang finally gets ready to die. He opens up his chest and sets off the self-destruct explosive there, despite everyone pleading to him to let himself live. Eventually, Master Liang dies and Narumi leaves the forest with Lucille and Mingxia, to go search for the Midnight Circus and deal with Lady Francine once and for all. To do this, however, Narumi and the others gather with other Shiroganis at the Harvest Building in Maine, USA, to discuss their next course of action. With multiple Shiroganis present to listen to the new plan, the MC, who's also a Shirogani, explains to the crowd that the canine Lucille, after knocking down Pantalone, had sniffed out a trail and found the headquarters of the Midnight Circus and the Automata to be located in the Sahara Desert. After explaining the fact to them, the MC leaves the stage for another reputable Shirogani to take over. Shirogani takes to the stage and makes a weird face to make the crowd laugh, but he soon realizes that nobody's there to laugh at his jokes. So, he cuts the BS and excites the fighting spirits. After he's done with his speech, every Shirogani from around the world gathers together and travels to the middle of the Sahara Desert to take down the HQ of the Midnight Circus. Meanwhile, Lucille, Narumi, the canine, and Mingxia all arrive at the circus by nightfall. Before they could proceed, countless UFOs arrived at the Saharan Desert to either witness or partake in the fight. Several miles away from the desert, in France, Ario, who's been spending his time traveling, finally wakes up one morning in his hotel room and sits outside the balcony to sightsee the beautiful French houses, while his one-night stand sleeps quietly on the bed. The lady wakes up shortly afterward, puts on some clothes, and commends Ario for being such a wonderful gentleman. She starts by asking Ario to tell her what he did for a living, and Ario outrightly tells her he's an ex-assassin who made shit tons of money enough for him to live a life of comfort. Upon hearing this, she tries to attach herself to him, but then again, Ario was no simp. He simply paid her for her services and showed her the door. At that instant, Narumi and his people are amazed by how many Shiroganis were able to show up for the great fight. Apparently, the UFOs that flew earlier were all Shiroganis who came to support the fight against the Automata. In due time, Fatima, one of the heads of the Shirogani, shows up and introduces herself. Soon after, the Shirogani from the USA showed up as well and presented themselves to be used in the fight against the Automata. Before beginning their campaign, the lead Shirogani from the USA talked about the four oldest Automata dolls created by Lady Francine herself. Pantalone, Dottori, 
Columbine, and Arlequino. He tells them to be wary of them all, as they fiercely protect their leader. With only seconds before they face their deaths, one of the female Shirogans incites the fighting spirit in her men, and walks into the tent of the Midnight Circus to get some action first. Seconds later, Dottore shows up from the Dark Circus entrance with the lady's head in his hands. He introduces himself to everyone, and welcomes them to the game. Then, he heads back into the circus tent, and challenges anyone strong enough to follow and fight him. Narumi, upon realizing just how bad the female Shirogane has things, reprimands her people for not grieving her death. Sadly, the Shirogani couldn't care less about the lady as she knew the risks before entering. Lucille calms Narumi and picks him and a few other Shiroganas to be on her team. Just then, another one of the Shiroganes outside gets impatient and rushes inside to take down his enemies. He ends up taking out about two Shirogans before the first stage of the circus. Every other Shirogan follows through and finds themselves on a stage with dozens of jesters cheering for the star of the show who is also their major opponent, Merry-Go-Round Olsen. One of the Shiroganis gets impatient again and charges at him blindly. However, he gets obliterated by the Merry-Go-Round. Soon, another one goes for it, and also ends up getting destroyed. Olsen gets up again and complains about the fight being too boring for him. Up next, Narumi gets ready to fight the mechanism. He cracks his fingers and walks closer to Olsen with murderous intent. At that point, Fatima asks Mingxia to tell her the kind of person Narumi is, and she tells her about just how powerful Narumi is. Thankfully, Narumi didn't disappoint as he made sure to destroy every part of the merry-go-round and advance his people to the next level. Meanwhile, Fatima and Mingxia are faced with two different jesters who challenge them to a fight. After picking their favorites, they get ready to fight them. Before letting her fight, Lucille pins Mingxia down and forces her to drink some drops of her blood so she can be somewhat immune to the Zonafa syndrome germs present in the tent. Mingxia initially throws a fit for this, but then again, Fatima manages to calm her down and bring her head back to normal. The fight begins in a few, and the girls stand their ground against the terrible jesters. Olsen keeps up with his tricks and works hand in hand with the two jesters to turn the tides of the battle in their favor. But then, at one point in the fight, Minxia and Fatima manage to regain the upper hand. Just as they were about to deliver the final blow, the jesters tore off some of their clothing and left them to cry their hearts out. The girls pretend to cry a little so they can get distracted. When they're sure they've gotten their attention, they they attack and destroy both jesters in a jiffy. Narumi also manages to land a fatal palm strike on Olsen's head which decapitates it and sends the merry-go-round head Olsen falling and begging for mercy. Once he's done, he puts some clothes on the kids and manages to wow the remaining Shirogani, who were watching the entire thing play out in front of them. Now that they've passed the first stage, the jester MC opens the floor under them and sends them down to the next level. Narumi and the others get up to find two doors in front of them. One of the doors takes them to Lady Francine while the other takes them to a deadlier place. Narumi, Lucille, and the other Shirogane leave Mingxia with the Doctor, Shirogane, and Fatima to watch over them while they work on choosing the best door to pass through. To do this, however, the group splits into two smaller groups with each one entering a door. Narumi pairs with Lucille, together with a select few Shirogans, and then enters the first doors. Inside, they find themselves in front of a flight of sinister stairs that look like they lead to the gates of hell itself. One of the Shiroganis, who calls herself Lena, makes a joke about the stairs and urges them to get a move on, if they're to find Lady Francine, before they finally get to the next door at the end of the stairs. Upon getting there, a voice from the room's PA system speaks up and congratulates them for passing the right door. To get through the next door, which leads to Francine's location, however, he tells the four of them that they have to fight and reduce their number to two so they can pass through the door safely. Naturally, Narumi isn't someone to allow himself to be manipulated, so he confronts the man for playing such a dirty trick. To make the game sweeter, the voice commands Spikes to appear from the side walls of the room and gives Narumi and his people 18 minutes to thin their numbers, or else they all get crushed. Also, he lets them know that part of the floor will fall into the pit underneath once every three minutes if they don't take it. Once he's done explaining, he leaves everything to Narumi to figure out. To save time, Narumi knocks Lena out and explains his plan to the others. Meanwhile, Ario and George take a chopper to fly to the Saharan Desert after landing in Arabia. Narumi, after taking down Lena, turns to his people and tells them he isn't fighting anybody. He tells Steve and Tor to get through the door while there's still time so they don't get struck down by the spikes. After the countdown of 18 minutes, 
the spikes are released and sent towards Steve and Tor. Narumi rushes in front without thinking and uses his fast reflexes to deflect as many spikes as he can. When he's done, however, he faces Steve and Tor, with dozens of spikes stuck in his body. As he removes each of them from his body, he tells Steve and Tor to head through the door and he'll join them later. After they leave, Lena wakes up and loses hope immediately. Narumi, however, tells her not to give up just yet, as he has a plan to get them through the door without fail. When the time is right, Narumi and Lena jump and punch a hole through the wall to get to the other room. Around that time, Mingxia regains consciousness. She checks around her body and realizes that she's been taken care of already. She gets back on her feet and asks after Narumi and the rest. Lucille tells her they're already long gone, but then they're going to catch up to them through another route she previously picked up. Right outside the circus, the dead automata release several tiny insectoid syndromes that infect Aerio in the chopper. To save him from getting consumed by the disease, George cuts his hand and makes Aerio swallow a tiny droplet of his blood to gain immunity to the automata. In the meantime, Narumi and the others face one other automaton who tries to prevent them from entering the next door. Narumi jumps into to stop the automaton but only ends up getting hit by the weird gun. Still, he gets back up and faces the automaton again. Only this time, he tells Steve and Lena to get a move on, so he can buy them some time. Minutes after they left, the rolling slasher, which is a big rolling crushing mechanism, is activated from the wall beside Narumi and moves closer to him with every second. Steve asks Narumi to survive for just five minutes, while he works on disarming the gears powering the rolling slasher. Narumi receives another hit from the weird gun and attaches himself to the gun. Then, when he gets close enough, he breaks the jester to pieces. Suddenly, the mechanism for the rolling slasher stops, and Narumi walks inside the gear room to find Steve stuck in one of them. In his dying moments, Steve sadly narrates his childhood experience to Narumi. Steve thanks Narumi for believing in him and standing in to defend him when he needed him the most. Before losing his life, he hands over a special goggles to Narumi and makes him promise to kill Lady Francine. Around that time, Irio and George find their way to the tent to witness the great battle. Narumi reunites with Tor and tells him about Steve's death. Tor realizes just how weak Narumi is and helps him up through a hall decorated with Francine's pictures to get to the room were there to face Francina. Along the way, Tor spills his secret and tells Narumi that he never really had a fiancé like he claimed to have back then. Rather, he explains what happened to him about 90 years ago when he saw Francine for the first time in his life. That day, his entire village was suffering from the Zonefa syndrome, and Francine came by with her jesters to check up on the village. She passed over the guy and made sure to step on his hand before completely leaving her. Rather than get pissed at her, Tor got attracted to her. He promised himself never to be that way again. This time, he's going to take Francine out, if he gets the chance to do so. Just then, the duo arrive at the Room of the Century and are reunited with their other colleagues who pass through the other door. This time, Dottore opens the stage and welcomes them to the room where Francine lives. To get to Francine, Dottore says Narumi and his colleagues have to beat him and the rest of the four oldest automata. At this point, we have reached the end of our video. If you like it, do not forget to put the like button and subscribe for more new videos.